Well, today uh, we're going to be talking about knowing what time it is, uh, which is very important, by the way. <laughs> In First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32, it shares a very interesting, quick and brief statement, but very intriguing. It says that the men of Issachar, um, from the tribe of Issachar, they understood the times. And therefore, they knew what Israel should do. Uh, this is uh, such a quick little short passage. It's kind of easy to read over, and it's easy to think, well, that's just kind of, a, let's just discard that. But it's super key to Israel and to us today to know the times. Of course, Solomon, one of the great wise sages in Scripture, writes for us in Ecclesiastes 3 that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. He says a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, a time to gather them, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search, time to give up, time to keep, time to throw away, time to tear, time to mend, a time to be silent. There's also a time to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, a time for peace. So Solomon says there, there's a time for everything. And between you and I, I think this is a time to speak. And I do think it's a time for war. We're in an incredible battle. In my lifetime, it's never been as hot, in my opinion, as it is currently. So it's not like I love war. I don't love battling. I'd much rather have a time of peace, but peace through strength, right? So um, here we are. I think there are a lot of people through history that knew what time it was. Uh, the Apostle Paul comes to mind uh, in the first century. He knew what time it was, and uh, he argued with philosophers at the Areopagus. He, he planted churches. He wrote books. He discipled people. Um, he didn't back down when there was opposition, and he was opposed, and he was chained, and he was imprisoned, and he was murdered by the state. Um, but he knew his task in the first century. Uh, Pastor John Wycliffe comes to mind. He was in the 14th century. He knew what time it was. He became the first proponent that the Bible should really be available in people's native tongue, in their common language. Of course, that was very costly for him. People didn't like that, but he knew it was time. Like, you, you, we have the Gutenberg Press. We have means to do it. We sh that was their issue for the day, like make the word of God available to people. Pastor and Protestant reformer Martin Luther back in the 16th century knew what time it was. He was the one who confronted the Catholic Pope, said the indulgences uh, that we're selling, that's, that's just wrong. Um, we need to get away from cuckoo and get back to reforming what the scriptures say and that the authority of scripture, not the tradition of the church was key. And that grace alone, through faith alone, through Christ alone, not works, was key. He knew, he knew the time he was in. That was the battle of the 16th century. And he showed up and accomplished what he needed. Methodist pastor John Wesley in the 18th century, um, he knew what time it was. He was the chief advocate for the abolishment of uh, slavery, which wasn't popular at the time. But he just knew that was the issue of the day. And as a pastor, he was part of the conscience of the state, and he needed to stand up and make a stand. And he and others ended up following, and of course, you know, that story's been written, and we're further down the road, though we still deal with slavery issues today. Virginia pastor Peter Mullenberg in 1776, 1776 knew what time it was as well. In fact, he preached Ecclesiastes 3, the passage, verse 8, a uh, time for war, a time for peace. Here he is preaching in his congregation, and then he, at the end of his uh, message, he unzips his black clerical robe and had his uh, officer's Continental Army uniform on and marches, you know, all the way to the back of the church and then tells the men 
come with me. It's time to battle. Who? The government. The, the tyrants. He, he was a pastor, but he knew the time was that, you know, England had to be dealt with. Uh, there was tyranny. German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer seemed to know what time it was in the 1940s. Of course, he was in uh, Nazi Germany when Hitler was not only canceling speech, but killing Jews. And by the way, murdering Christians who were resisting the, the socialist uh, movement. Uh, uh, he lost his life, like many other men and women throughout history, but he knew that what his duty was. He knew what time it was. That was the battle of his day. You know, he could have been preaching about the authority of Scripture, which Martin Luther, in the, the great reformer, did, but that wasn't the issue of the day. The killing of the Jews was the issue of the day. And to, to not address that would have been kind of like, well, that's, you're, you're missing what, what you're called to do. God puts us in a certain time, in a certain place, for a certain reason. American pastor Billy Graham knew what time it was back in the 1950s during the post-World War II era. It was what we called the Cold War. Remember what was called the Red Scare? There was a lot of socialist, communist fear and anxiety growing in our country like it is today. And it was Billy Graham who turned the tide of American popular opinion because he shared with people state to state preaching how communism was godless and would ruin our nation. He didn't just say, well, that's the state's responsibility. He realized that pastors had to be the conscience of the state, and quite frankly, uh, America really shifted around in the 50s, primarily because of Billy Graham. I suspect it was also Atlanta Baptist pastor Martin Luther King Jr., later in the 60s, who was really the impetus to kind of giving national recognition to the civil rights movement. Uh, again, I've listed all pastors, uh, just so that you know historically, like pastors have always seen their role as being a conscience of the state, having some uh, role in helping the population, and their, not just their congregations, but their cities, to recognize the issues of their day, to take a stand and help mobilize forces for that. So today, of course, in the 21st century, there's all kinds of people that still want to say, to me and others, don't be so political. But <laughs> we've been political from the very get-go. Why? Because God created nations. And he created prophets to be a conscience of the state. That's why Daniel had to deal with Nebuchadnezzar, and Moses had to deal with Pharaoh, and Esther had to deal with Xerxes. Of course, we live in a country where we have checks and balances and different things. Historically, no governments had checks and balances. Historically, they were ruled by kings, monarchs, tyrants who had like full sway to do whatever. God raised up prophets, priests, and pastors to confront authority. Now in our country, you think, well, we have different parties and different segments and stuff. Yeah, but we still haven't lost our role in the pulpit to preach for God and to understand what the issues of our day are and understand our times. I'd love to say that we're doing great right now, uh, confronting our current godless culture, the culture of death and destruction, wokeness, weirdness, wickedness, lawlessness, tyranny, <laughs> cancel culture, DEI, CRT, BLM, LGBT, I gotta buy a consonant here. Um, <laughs> but most pastors don't know what time it is, unfortunately. But be encouraged, many do. Most don't, but we have enough. I think we have the 300 we need to win the battle. Uh, Pastor Jack Hibbs here in California, Pastor Gary Hamrick in Virginia, Pastor Alan Jackson in Tennessee, Pastor Jeff Schwarzentraub in Col Colorado, Pastor Mark Driscoll in Arizona, Pastor Landon Schott in Texas, Pastor Chuck Ramsey in Georgia, Pastor Marty Yost in Idaho, Pastor Steve Smotherman in New Mexico. Uh, I, I could go on. These are all guys that I got to connect with this summer. These guys get it. They know that the church isn't to be inoculated, hiding like an ostrich putting its head in the sand. They know we have to understand the times we're living in and to address those. So I'm very encouraged there are people that are doing that. So 
Let's go back to our text again, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. It's just one verse, but it says this, from the tribes of Issachar, there were men who understood the times. They knew the temper of the times. They were politically savvy, public square aware men, and they knew, in other words, they had knowledge what Israel should do. They knew the best course of action. They knew what had to be addressed. They knew what weeds need to be pulled from the garden. And their chiefs or their leaders were 200 and all their kinsmen, their relatives who were with them were under their command. So in First Chronicles, you have a listing of all these different tribes. It says, well, this one tribe from the tribe of Issachar, they, they, they knew what was going on. These guys were super savvy. There were 12 sons of Jacob, 12 sons of Israel. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. And Issachar was the fifth son of Jacob and Leah, the ninth son overall for the patriarch. He had four sons. He followed his father down to Egypt. He ended up dying there and was buried. But his descendants formed the tribe of Issachar. And uh, after the wanderings through Israel and the Sinai Desert, the men of Issachar numbered about 60,000 men. Uh, there was a lot of fighting men there. When the Promised Land was given to the tribes, Issachar was given 16 cities and adjoining villages to, to oversee. And by the time of David, who was confronting Saul at the time, there were probably about 90,000 men of Issachar and known for their wisdom and their super savvy and politically astute uh, men who understood uh, their mission and their time. And so we don't know much more about them. There's not a lot that's said about them. But what we know is knowing the significance of the times is key to successful uh, leadership and living. Uh, this doesn't mean they just knew headlines and some tweets. Um, they knew what was significant. They knew the events, the movements, the, the trends, the ideologies, the currents, uh, the worldviews, if you will, that needed to be addressed in their time. They knew what was shaping the nation, forming the nation, molding the nation, and they knew what they needed to think, what they needed to do, and how they needed to act for their time. And so the men of Issachar, I think, are just really great in inspiring reminders to us that we're responsible not for what they were dealing with but what we're dealing with that God has put us here in the 21st century we're to be heads up with what's happening in our culture what's happening in our public schools what's happening in our nation what trends what worldviews what ideologies are infecting and poisoning our people and that we have some duty to take responsibility for that, not just do a word study out of scriptures that doesn't apply to the times we're living in. There's all scriptures inspired, but it's not all profitable for the moment. And so uh, the men of Issachar inspire me and hopefully inspire you to say, OK, well, what is our role? What's the challenge of our generation and what is the. The, the, the place we need to take part in, in the epic struggle, struggle for good and evil, right and wrong. Uh, what direction is the culture heading in and what is our role in doing something that's meaningful and consequential, impactful and influential in making sure that the church takes its proper place and that individually we all take our proper place in the times that we're living in. I've shared with you historically before that Elizabeth Rundle Charles uh, wrote about uh, applying the truth really in the times you're living in. I think her words are super worth repeating. She says, it's the specific targeted truth which is actually assailed in any age. In other words, whatever truth is being bombarded and besieged or assaulted and attacked in that moment, in that time, that's the truth that tests your fidelity. It is to confess we are called, not merely what she calls profess. If I simply profess, we, we're really with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition, every portion of the truth of God, except 
precisely the little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I'm not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christianity. Because where the battle rages, the loyalty of the soldier is proved. Her, her point is like, if the battle's over there, even if you've got all your armor on, but you're over there, okay, you're, you're dressed like a Christian, but you're not dealing with the battle at hand. Even if you preach all truth, but not the truth that deals with Jews being killed in 1940 when you live in Germany, you're not really confessing Christ. You're just professing generic truth, but not dealing with what you're dealing with. And this is one of the things that we're, we're grappling with together. We're all learning together. What are the things we have to address because we'll stand accountable to God, not for the Jews in Germany, but for what's happening in our world and our role in it. In other words, where the conflict and the co combat is actually happening, where the actual action and assault is actually occurring, that's what tests our fidelity, integrity, devotion, and allegiance. And of course, that's where our faith is actually demonstrated and tested and verified and <coughs> confirmed and settled. And I think I agree with uh, Elizabeth Charles, and that is to fly away from to flinch, to falter in the areas that we're actually supposed to be grappling with is just cowardice. Um, we're at war and to balk and to blink and to shirk and shrink with the chaos and confusion that our culture is dealing with is just terrible. And I don't need to tell you, you already know this, right? That progressive, leftist, globalist, Marxist wolves have already shut down our churches in our lifetime, infiltrated our schools, control our culture, ravage our flocks with their pagan perversions, and uh, we have some duty to deal with that. I do think one of the issues of our day is the issue of anthropology, if you will. What is a man? What is a woman? What is a marriage? I, I don't know why it's so confusing right now, but that seems to be a battle today. It, which includes what is a, a fetus? What's an embryo? What's a baby? What's life? This has gotten super confusing. Um, people don't seem to know if a human person is, uh, you know, part of a created, ordered, intelligent cosmos and has a design that was appointed with an objective identity, or whether they're to like, make themselves their own self-selected, subjective, fluid identity in a random relative world without God. There, there seems to be confusion over this. And of course, we can profess scripture all we want, but if we don't confess scripture on these issues, I think we're missing the boat. If I were to give a kind of a medical analogy, it would be like if I just cover my body <laughs> with, I don't know, peroxide or neosporin or some medication, right? But I don't put the neosporin on the place where the injury is. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's not touching the wound. So you can neosporin yourself all you want. It's not really going to help. Um, if you have a medicine cabinet filled with all kinds of medications, but it doesn't have the one that you're actually sick of, the, the one you actually need, it's just generic medication. It doesn't actually help you. And I think this is one of the issues the church has to grapple with today, that we have a lot of, we have an arsenal of truth, but if we're not using the truths that apply to the injuries, the poisons, the, the craziness that we're actually dealing with, we may be professing Christ, but we're not really confessing him. We're not, we may be talking about generic Christianity, but we're, we're not understanding the times. We're not being the men of Issachar and the women of Issachar we need to be. So I'm hoping uh, we continue to be a fellowship that doesn't withdraw uh, our candor, our clarity, and our courage in dealing with the issues that are currently dealing uh, with our culture. And you remember, this goes all the way back to Adam, by the way, right? Remember Adam and Eve, they disobeyed God, and then God 
kind of shouts out, you know, Adam, <laughs> where are you? You know, <laughs> he's hiding. Uh, God's still doing that. Pastors, where are you? Are you're, you're tracking like babies are getting killed every day in your city. Um, school boards are flipping out and doing crazy stuff to your kids like right now. Um, they're shutting down your businesses. They're <laughs> doing like, where are you? Where are you, church? Where are you, Christians? You know, oh, we're doing just a Bible study on this topic or that study. It's like, but that's not what's your MIA on the issues that happen. Where the battle rages, the loyalty and fidelity of the soldier is actually proved. So today I thought uh, I'd remind you of First Chronicles. We want to be people of that understand our times, and therefore that's part of God's providence. If slavery was the issue of our day and we didn't speak on that, w that would be a problem. If, um, you know, there was another battle at hand and we didn't deal with that, but we have to deal with the battles we've been given and trust that God's perfect providence is he has us here apparently because that's what he wants us to deal with. Now, so you're encouraged and you're not discouraged that, you know, we're just crazy people in the 21st century. I want to give you one more passage this morning. Uh, Second Timothy. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Paul's a pastor talking to Timothy, a young pastor. Uh, Timothy got sick a lot, so he was a little bit, uh, had a reputation for kind of being weak a little bit. Uh, vulnerable, maybe vulnerable. So Paul is getting ready to die. This is his last of uh, 13 letters that he wrote uh, in his second one to Timothy. And uh, he's a little concerned. He's concerned that he's going to die. He's passing the torch to Timothy and that Timothy may be a little bit too gullible or naive or a little bit green and kind of maybe think people are basically good. And even though there's a lot of hostility happening in the Roman Empire at the time, He's afraid Timothy might think, well, if we just lay low during the COVID stuff, like it'll all return. You know, if we just don't say anything about the Biden-Harris administration, like don't worry, it, it'll all work itself out. He's afraid he, he, Timothy might, he's like, no, it, it's not going to work out. That's no, people are nutty. Uh, you have to battle. You, you're going to have to fight. A and by the way, this isn't a temporary fight. This is Every generation is going to have to fight for freedom. Every generation is going to have to fight for truth. Every <laughs> like this is not going to go away. And so Paul gives Timothy a exhortation of what Timothy could expect in the culture he was living in. And I think you're going to relate to it because if it sounds like the people we're dealing with, it is. Um, because people don't change that much over time, right? So... If you have your, your scripture still there and you want to turn to the New Testament, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 1. And uh, we'll just take this, too, that you need to know the times you're living in. But in terms of the people you're living with, we have issues in different centuries and times. But people characteristics are pretty similar. So I think this will resonate for you. He says this in verse 1. But mark this. Okay, that's a way to say, realize this, Timothy. Be certain of this. Do not be naive. <laughs> Timothy, focus. Okay, mark this. Underline, highlight, circle, put a star. There will be terrible times in these last days. We're living in the last days. As soon as Christ came, we started living in the last days. Uh, w when Peter preached on Pentecost, he said that the Spirit was there as being released in these last days. When you go to Hebrews, it says that God revealed His Son to us in these last days. We are living in the last days. The last days is not some future projection. Paul is like, Timothy, you're tracking. We're living in the last days. We've been living in the last days for 2,000 years now. And it's, there's going to be terrible times. Awful times. Uh, chalepos, it's the Greek for hard, perilous times, hard to bear physically, mentally, emotionally, hard to deal with because they're violent, dangerous, and menacing, menacing uh, hard to endure. Uh, this word, uh, 
Chalepos is used of dangerous wild animals. It's used of a raging sea. The only other place in the New Testament, it's used of two uh, gathering demoniacs. That's like two wild, savage, demon-possessed crazies. Um, so I, I think he, he's trying to be super clear to Timothy. Um, you're going to have, it, it, ministry is going to be super challenging. So don't be naive. And, and Timothy already knew Paul had already written prison epistles. He's already been arrested. He's already been uh, imprisoned. Um, people in Asia were after him. They were after Timothy too, so he knows firsthand. Um, he tries to tell him in this letter as well, as well that the word battles and the godless chatter and the stupid, senseless controversies. I, I could write a whole book on all the senseless controversies that have happened in the church just in my simple lifetime. It's just stupid stuff. Just the bread wasn't right in communion. The song was too loud. The carpet color was just, just senseless. And he tries to spend time with Timothy saying, don't get derailed by all that crazy. It's crazy. That's not what you need to be worried about. There's going to be a lot of that. Uh, false teachers and demons are behind all that stuff to kind of keep you away from reality. But don't be gullible. Don't be overly optimistic. In these last days, times are going to be super challenging. And I just want you to have a heads up. And he's like, the problem, verse 2, is... Not the church, not the, 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 the structure of the elders and the deacons or the way the plate is passed or the way communion is. The, the problem is people. The church would be fantastic. Every pastor I know is like, if we could get rid of our people, our <laughs> <laughs> the church model we have is unbelievable. It's so well structured. We got like a game plan and we got, you know, four points of discipleship and they got, you know, <laughs> But the people, you know, what do you do with the people? And so he says the people will be <laughs> uh, the fallen, in process, still growing, somewhat immature people. Are th These are what you're going to have to deal with. They have a lot of cuckoo. And he's like, just so I'm clear, because this is my last letter, I'm going to give you 19 expressions of what these people are like. 19 descriptors. Um, and th from first to last, the, the first one is going to be file a toy. That means they're going to be lovers of themselves. And the last is philo theo. They will not be lovers of God. That's like two great bookends. <laughs> they are narcissistic, all about themselves. And they are not lovers of God. Just so that you have a nice a little frame of these 19 characteristics that you need to be heads up on. You need to understand the times we're living in. And you need to know the people and what they're like. And they are a little bit of a nightmare. So, and four of them, by the way, have to do with love. Love misdirected. It's, it's love of self, love of money, and love of pleasure are all going to show up in this. But not love of God. I think that, that's a great sermon in and of itself. Love of self, money, and pleasure. Just so you're tracking with what we're, the times we're living in, that's what people love. But apart from those terms on love, he gives 15 other expressions, and he starts relational. They'll be lovers of themselves, which should be translated, they're selfish, they're self-centered, they're self-absorbed, they're narcissistic, They'll be lovers of money, which means they're greedy. And then he gives like three descriptions of that self-love. They'll be boastful, proud, and abusive. To be boastful, alazanes, it means to be self-promoting. It means self-absorbed. They'll be proud, hyper ephanoi, arrogant, haughty, could be translated stuck up, conceited, and therefore they'll be abusive. They'll be rude, slanderous, insulting, profane, because they have an exaggerated sense of themselves. Okay, does this sound like today? Like, do you ever read the scripture and go, is he writing us or was he writing them? Or <laughs> I guess he's writing them and us. Just so you're tracking the times you're living in, in these last days, people are nuts. 
And as for family life, let me give you five uh, little characteristics. They're going to be disobedient to the parents. They'll, they'll be contemptuous. They, they will not be honoring of parents. They'll be ungrateful, could be translated unthankful, like lacking appreciation. They'll be unholy, which means irreligious, godless. They'll be without a storge. They will not have family love. They don't even know what, they won't even know what a family is. They'll be inhumane. They'll be unforgiving, aspondoi, means unbending, hateful, merciless. Um, so <laughs> just so you're tracking, even if you're a believer, raising kids is going to be super hard. If you think you're going to have just obedient, grateful, respectful, affectionate, reasonable, loving kids, you're not tracking. If you have that, you're blessed. And there is a relationship between how you parent and sometimes how they come out. But it's not a direct relationship. You can parent great and they can turn out crazy. And I've met some crazy parents. I don't know. Their kids are fine. <laughs> so it's not a totally direct relationship. But just so you're tracking, you're going to be dealing with people, Timothy, where even in the family, there's going to be a lot of angst. And let me throw in seven more words here just to talk about people in general. They'll be slanderous. They'll gossip. They'll make crap up. They'll be fake news, false accusations. The, 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 they're scandal mongers. They love that stuff. They'll be without self-control. They won't even be able to govern themselves. Uh, they'll be very impulsive, wild, violent, under the guise of, I'm just spontaneous. They'll be brutal. No pity. Savage. They won't even be, be lovers of the good. They'll be cynical. They'll be haters. It, it always shocks me, if you've traveled around the world at all, that there's people that don't like our country. I know it has a ton of flaws, but it's a, this, this is like the best you can get in a fallen world. Like, but they don't love the good. They'll be treacherous, which means they'll be traitorous. They'll betray you. There, in other words, there's a lot of Judases, and Christ modeled that. There was one in his own team. So, you know, you don't have to feel too bad if you feel like, I'm betrayed by my best friend, or... Uh, how do people turn on you? I thought I worked 20 years for this employer. And it's like, who cares? They'll be rash, which means reckless and ruthless. And they'll be conceited. Could be translated puffed up or bloated or really swollen with pride. And then he goes on to say, let me give you a couple final ones here. They will be lovers of pleasure. They'll be so into sex and perversion and trannies and weirdness and lust rather than lovers of God. Timothy, I, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I just don't want to leave here on my last writing <laughs> to you and leave you with the impression, you're going to love ministry. Pastoring a small church is going to be so fun. No, you're going to be dealing with people, super big problem. And they have lots of characteristics. I'll name just 19 to start with. Just so you have a little bit of the fallenness of man in these last days, they are self Focus, not God focus, and there's all kinds of things you're going to have to deal with. So not only do you have to deal with the slavery issue or killing the Jews or abortion or CRT or BLM or the issues of your day, you have to deal with people while you're addressing the issues of your times. And they're very complicated. And he kind of sums up their spiritual state here in verse 5. They have a form of godliness but they deny its power. So they probably will have the outward making of like a spirituality. Maybe they'll go to church. Maybe they have a fish sticker on their car. Maybe they say things like, amen. You know, they like they do some Christianese kind of things, but it's they're like a pinata. It's, it, it's just the form, but not the substance. It's the outward show, but not the inward reality. It's Religion without the morals. It's faith without the works. The, the, they are going to be like in your churches, but they're not real. I was, uh, there's a famous NBA basketball player that uh, was quoted this week. I saw him on some social media posts. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he was just saying that he's voting for Kamala because he thinks the abortion issue is super important. 
and I was just like, <laughs> no names like Curry or anything come to mind. But I'm like, that, that just, this is, I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm trying to do my job. My job is to warn you of crazy crap. That's crazy. You can't be a Christian and like want babies dead. That, that's a total disconnect. I, 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 the, the part of me that wants to be charitable and say, I'm sure you're a great guy and you mean well and maybe you go to church and maybe you've given money to some cause or something that's super cool, but you cannot really be a true believer and like promote a culture of death. That's a total disconnect. You don't have to say that. I have to say that. I, I, I live in this time that came across my radar and it's like, no. Just between you and I, that, that does not fly. That's not real. That, it's just, that's a form of godliness, but you deny the power. You, you can't be spirit-led. No spirit would ever tell you to say something like that. And Paul goes on to say, have nothing to do with them. That's not have nothing to do with non-believers. We expect them to have these characteristics. They don't have God. They don't have spirit. They don't have anything transcendent. They, they don't have anything eternal. So yeah, they're going to be a little crazy, and we're going to try to love them the best we can. But people who claim to be Christians and then do crazy stuff like that, that's deceptive people. Have nothing to do with that. You can't be that duplicitous. You can't say you, you follow God and want to obey him and then just do your own thing with radical. Not, I'm not talking about a quiet, like in your own heart, like I kind of lean towards this. No, I'm going to go on a public platform and tell millions of people that you can do this. You can be godly and live a perverted life. You can be godly and steal money. You can be godly and murder people. It's like, no. That, that doesn't fly. Don't have anything to do with people like that. Well, anyways, it's nice and warm today, so maybe we should conclude, right? Knowing what time it is is very important. First Chronicles 12.32 says, The men of Issachar understood the times they were living in and therefore because they knew the times they were living in they knew what they needed to do we don't have to deal with the british i don't have to take my robe off and say i'm part of the continental army we got to fight this tyranny that's not my battle but Mueller, muhlenberg knew that that was his battle it's not ours we need to know what times we live in and what we need to do and ecclesiastes solomon reminds us there is a time for everything as much as I like a time of peace, there is a time to war. As much as I like being quiet at times, there's a time to speak up. And I think now might be that time. And Paul reminds Timothy in these last days, just be <laughs> super heads up. Mark this. <laughs> there will be terrible times in the end. It's going to be super challenging. It's going to be a battle. It's... it's just mark it, Timothy, and you mark it. People are going to be lovers of themselves, not lovers of God. And I give you a whole 17 other attributes in between that. Well, if they're non-believers, we expect that. If they're believers, we can't associate with that. We have to take a stand. We have to know the times we're living in. We've got to be courageous enough to do something about what's happening in our culture. Our goal is not to be political, our goal is to be biblical. And if God addresses it and it deals with our people and he wants us to be heads up in our time, we're going to try to be heads up. Amen?